Welcome to Sexually Charged Radio, co-hosted by Ruth Newstifter and Thomas Asso. We and our guests discuss your questions about sex, sexuality, and gender in a sex-positive, safe, and educational manner. Welcome to Sexually Charged Radio. I'm your co-host, Ruthie, and I'm here with... Thomas. And... Bowen. And... Jason. And we are super... You said that really sad. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, uh, we are here on 93.3 FM, CFRU, and we're talking about sex and relationships and gender and intimacy and all kinds of stuff. And we're going to be talking about um, discrepant desire levels, as therapists might say. So that's when... Uh, somebody in the relationship wants sex or lots of sex and another person in the relationship doesn't want sex or just doesn't want as much sex. This isn't so much about wanting different things, but about just different lusty levels. Um, but before we get into this, I would love it if we could do a quick introduction and you can tell us your name, pronouns, whatever you want to share about yourself briefly. And then, um, one weird idea you had about relationships um as a kid i'm on this as a kid kick so um something you thought about relationships or families or marriage or like whatever that now you're like oh that was a little weird or maybe that was uh that was mysteriously intelligent perhaps perhaps it was surprisingly insightful who wants to go first sure i'll (laughs) jump under that bus um i'm thomas i'm Uh, I use the pronouns he or they. Uh, I identify as a gay queer individual, and uh, I'm white, living with uh, invisible disabilities, and um, progressively socially liberal. um, Because I don't think, I've never actually, I think, disclosed my political standing. People just have to guess. How would anyone know? How would would they know? know? Um, And in terms of that fun-filled childhood question... uh, I think I may have used this one before on a show. Maybe I haven't. I say it a lot in my life. So when I was younger, I didn't really understand weddings. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand kissing either. Mm -hmm. Um, So I always assumed that, like, when a bride and groom, because that's all I knew growing up, um, got married, that they had to, like, practice kissing beforehand. And they had this whole, like we're going to kiss for this amount of seconds. It's going to be this type of kiss. It's Mm -hmm. and all of this. And I just had this like, like on at the wedding ceremony. I mean, there's something to be said for not smacking heads. So like getting your (laughs) angle correct. Yeah. But like, it was like at the ceremony, it's going to be this like orchestrated choreographed, like very specific thing rather than just like, all right, like this is something they've been kissing for so long that they just like know some of that. Like a kissing coach for your wedding. Yeah. Oh, there's a new career for us. (laughs) Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Bowen. I'm a second year biomed student at the University of Guelph. And I and my pronouns are he and they. And I guess one weird thing, I suppose, um, I, I had an idea about relationships was that when I was younger, my parents would tell me that when two people get together and they have a baby, a stork would bring the baby to you, actually. And so for the longest time, I've always thought that when I get married, a random bird would fly by my house and drop a kid off at the door. Watch so, out for that. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that was one really weird idea. I think I had until I was like... So you really believe the stork thing? Yeah, I really believe the stork thing. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Hmm. Good. Uh, I'll try to introduce myself next. I'm Ruthie. I teach in the couple and family... I don't know. I just feel (laughs) weird making myself go last. I'm in the couple and family therapy program, and uh, I teach therapy here, and I research sex and um, trauma and all sorts of things like that. I use the pronouns they, them. I'm non-binary genderqueer. I'm white. I'm uh, not monogamous and kinky and all that good fun stuff. Um, uh, my childhood thing. Well, I was thinking that, that I thought that everyone who lived together was in a relationship together. So that meant that if a house had lots of different apartments, then all those people actually were a family and in a relationship together. Um, and so I had no concept of like housemates and things like that. So you can tell I lived in a small town where there were no giant apartment buildings. Although I guess that would have just seemed exciting. (laughs) Um, yeah. So that one, the other thing is, um, I went to private Catholic high school and, um, I'm sorry. And this is what happens to us later. So I knew that, um, people assigned male at birth could masturbate and have orgasms, but I didn't know that about people assigned female at birth until my late teens. And I've been catching up ever since. (laughs) (laughs) So now me, uh, my name is Jason. I am a, uh, master's student here at the university of Guelph in the couple and family therapy program. I'm finishing up my first year, going into my second year shortly. 
Um, I, what, what is my childhood thing? Hmm. In my upbringing, what would have been normalized or expected is this idea of um, uh, uh, two parents, and both of these parents are opposite sex, heterosexual, married, etc. Um, but I guess bringing in my culture as, as being Latino um, to the mix, one thing would be having frequent gatherings with large family members, mm-hmm. uh, not large in size, but large in number. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So that I guess that that'll be my thing, where uh, family gets together and family gets like together yeah. in frequency and in number of people is a very normal and expected thing and desired. Because I know in my background there might be a lot of humor about like, oh crap, I got to go to the family reunion or something. But this is like a fun thing people want to do. You know what? I think it's a bit of both. I think at first, <laughs> at first you start off with like, oh damn, do I actually have to do this? And then when you're in it, it's like, yeah, that was actually fun. Um, I know for me, it's, it's oftentimes desired, but there's, there's those moments where it's like, I'd rather not. Gotcha. So, yeah. I think we got everybody. So, so discrepant desire levels. I, I think that this did not occur to me until I was older. Like it never, I would not have occurred to me as a youth or a teenager that there might be people in a relationship where one person wants sex way more and the other person wants sex way less or not at all. I think Probably because as an adolescent, um, the cool thing to do is to say or behave as though you want sex all the time. I'm sure there's there's folks who don't. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, at least when I was younger, asexuality, like, wasn't really known. I'm sure there were some people knowing the word, but it wasn't, like, a thing you'd ever seen on TV or heard on the radio or talked about. Um, and not that all people who have lower... Uh, sexual interest levels are asexual, but just as an example. So then, uh, you know, you kind of get closer to adulthood, you meet other adults and things like that. And you learn that this is really common. Not everybody mm-hmm. has the same sex drive. Um, so uh, in relationships, let's say it's two people in the relationship with each other and, and let's say they're monogamous or mostly monogamous. Um, do you feel like it's automatically a deal breaker and doomed to fail if one person has a higher sex drive than the other? First gut thoughts beyond that is complicated. My first gut thought is, is it a deal breaker? No. Would there be tension in this relationship? Yes. Yeah. I think, I think at the beginning it wouldn't be a deal breaker, but I would be worried that in time it would become one. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Bowen? I am not sure. This is, this topic has never went through my mind before, <laughs> so I need a bit more time. Um, uh, good answer, because it is like it's a difficult one, and if you haven't faced it either because of your own relationship or because somebody's told you about it, mm-hmm. then I don't know that you would necessarily think about it unless you happen to see it on TV. But I don't see this issue on TV except to really stigmatize somebody for being a sex addict. Um, so then the problem isn't discrepant levels of desire; it's that someone's a sex addict, right? So somebody's not normal. That's why it's a problem. Or that somebody is frigid or something like that. So then again, instead of saying, well, these are two people well within the range of normal who just aren't on the same level, it's talking about it like, oh, no, one person's a problem. We fix their problem and then it'll be and then they'll auto match up again. Right. Um, so follow up question to this. Oh, my answer would be, um, there, I think, I think lots and lots of people make it work. And I think it depends on maybe the bases of the relationship and how they negotiate that out with each other. Right. Um, so my follow up question that I'm always interested in is when two people have different sexual interest levels, should the person who wants more be cool with having less or should the person who wants less be cool with having more Or should they both be cool with not their ideal situation? And does it matter to you what the genders are in this question? Boom. Right there. (laughs) Bowen, you look so thoughtful right now. It looks like you're just doing all this complicated math. Is that me going out around you? (laughs) I don't know. I'm just thinking a lot because I've been reading a lot these days. And um, I think everyone should be okay with just not getting what they want. Because the world isn't perfect and you're not, you're not, it's not like everyone's supposed to cater to your needs. So I feel like, yeah, if you want more, you have to be okay with being less, but that's just a trade-off for being with someone you love. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the opinion that I hold right now. 
But if somebody wants less, should they be also okay with having more? Like, are both people coming to the middle? Yeah, that's my idea. It's like, you want to go to, you want to be somewhere where you're both okay being there because you know that you're not going to get, it's not perfect. It's not like a Disney movie where it's happily ever after. It's going to take a lot of work. And that's where relationships, I think, in my opinion, are. They're just work. But Mm -hmm. they're work that's worth putting into if you want something good out of it. So let's say it's a straight relationship. Mm-hmm. It's a guy and a gal. And he wants, we'll go stereotypical here. He wants to have sex five times a week. And she wants to have sex once every other week. Um, and so they're going to balance it out at twice a week. I don't know about the math on that. But let's say that's what they did. <laughs> and so then is it okay for her to be expected to have sex she doesn't want um, three out of four times? Well, it's a toughie. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> but um, I think again, it's um, how much do you really love your partner? How much do you want to fulfill their needs in the end, right? Because then, if you're talking about yeah, she doesn't want it, and yes, he wants more, but in the end, you gotta look at it. It's like if this is the deal breaker, then it wasn't then it wasn't gonna work out either way. So, but if you were willing to put in the work, it's like, okay, I don't want it, but I love him. And what he does for me beyond sex is worth putting this in. Then yes, I'll do it. Right. And I think for a lot of people that gendering would sound really uncomfortable, but I see tons of straight couples where, um, he does not want hardly any sex and she wants it regularly. And the social kind of pressure is for him to just put out more often. And generally, nobody feels like that's weird, coercive, or abusive. So, like, there's so much gender in how we think about this Mm -hmm. and, like, what constitutes pressure. But also, though you didn't say this out loud, I'm thinking to myself when you're talking about, like, what else is in the relationship and stuff, like, what I heard maybe you implying, you could correct me if I'm wrong, is thinking about, like... Can this be a neutral or better sexual experience for her? Can she be getting other relational things out of that interaction at the same time, which may not be carnal in nature? Sorry, that took a bit of processing, but yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Cool, cool. So what do you think? Um, uh, somebody wants more, somebody wants less. Well, I'm, I'm actually still thinking back to what Bone was saying earlier. Um about putting in, just putting in the work and, and if you're in a relationship and you love them um, to satisfy your partner. And a lot of that sort of what, what I took that to mean is, is do things for the other person. But how, what about if we take that and just flip it? How can we do things for ourselves as sexual people engaging in a sexual act with somebody else? Why are we sort of um, in, in that example, in a way, uh, giving up to some extent um, our own sexual satisfaction and our own sexual needs when it comes to who cares about me? Let me, I'm just doing this for you. Right. So which the other partner may not mm-hmm. like, like a lot of people want to have sex with an eager, engaged partner. Right. And that's a lot to ask of somebody. I want you to have sex. You don't necessarily want to have, and I want you to be eager and engaged and into it. Like, what? whoa, <laughs> you know, right. right. Why, why then? What's yeah. my motivation? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I think I initially was very much, um, related to like, well, what, where's the consent piece here? Mm -hmm. You know, we're asking somebody to have more sex than they want. Is, is this consensual? Is there some coercion involved there? Uh, Then you threw in sort of the gender dynamics there and that threw me for a tailspin because you're right. I think we, we have this um, mismatch of, you know, if, if, if we ask men to have more sex, That's okay. Yeah, when I see male-male couples or, you know, larger relationship groups, like, there's this expectation that everyone should have a very high sex drive, Mm -hmm. and they all are expecting it of themselves and of each other. But the other part, I think when I first heard this question, I wasn't even thinking about levels of sex drive. I was thinking about types of sex and discrepancy there. And so, you know, kind of going back to the initial question of, you know, misconceptions as a child... I mean, I thought sex was just vanilla Mm -hmm. um, growing up. And I think we have individuals who really just want vanilla versus those who want kinkier, more exciting. Well, that's... Mm -hmm. (laughs) Adventure (laughs) sex. More adventure sex. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that also puts in in a different uh, discrepancy level here. And so now I've got this, like, matrix in my head going on of, okay, you're in this quadrant, this quadrant, this one, or this one, based off of the type of sex and the frequency of sex. 
And how do we possibly... How do people ever find each other for a good long-term match? That's what that's going through my head right now. I'm like, oh, yeah. we're just all doomed anyway, yeah. so why do we even try? So <laughs> yeah. um, but I really liked Jason's point of, you know, how do we think of ourselves as sexual beings and within these dynamics? And, you know, so what we do for ourselves, what we do for our partners or with our partners, but also how do we look outside of in, us as individuals, whether to toys, whether to parties, whether to open relationships and all of those beautiful pieces that uh, could help with some of these desired discrepancies. Sure. And speaking of discrepancies, you know what time it is? Uh, a non-discrepant time to announce that you are listening to Sexually Charged Radio on 93.3 FM or on CFRU.ca. And uh, you might also be listening to us on YouTube if you search for Sexually Charged there. And uh, how do people get in touch with us if they want to send a question? So if you'd like to send in a question or have us talk about something or comment on something we've talked about, you can email AskSC, the initials for Sexually Charged, at U-O-G-U-E-L-P-H dot C-A. That's AskSC at U-O-G-U-E-L-P-H dot C-A. And our wonderful volunteers at Student Wellness will receive your questions. Some of those will be forwarded on to us. And maybe you'll hear your question or topic uh, discussed in one of our future shows. Thank you, Thomas. So so when we're talking about all this and like what's okay to expect of different people, I'm, I'm also thinking about the importance of a broad definition of sex and what people want out of sex, right? Mm -hmm. So people could want pleasure. People could want emotional intimacy. People could want to be affirmed in their gender. People could want all sorts of different things out of, um, out of sex. Uh, they could want kids. I always forget to list that one. Um, all sorts of things are possible. And, uh, and it is important to remember that pleasure is one of those things too. Um, so if you want specific sexual stimulation, like that's kind of difficult to get without sex um, or masturbation. But if you're looking for emotional intimacy and closeness, and that's a big part of why uh, you want more sex or less sex, then there might be conversations about that. But there's so many people who think of penetrative sex as like the real sex, right? Mm -hmm. And um, might be more open and happy to a broader definition of sex, which might not even necessarily include orgasms. So I work with folks a lot on getting rid of what we call a phallocentric definition of sex, which means that sex is defined by when a penis goes in an orifice and then the penis orgasms and then the sex is over. And then hopefully the person with the orifice also was pleasured during that period of time, but now it's done. Um, and that's, uh, it's really hard to have successful sex that way reliably across the lifespan. If that is it, if that's your definition. Um, so that doesn't always necessarily fit desire discrepancies, but sometimes I talk to people about the idea of, um, masturbating with each other and perhaps one person holds the other while the other person's masturbating and the person doing the holding is, uh, there's all this great skin on skin contact between mm -hmm. the two of them. There can be a lot of emotional intimacy, um, the other person is receiving touch, although not necessarily sexually stimulating touch, or they could be, they could be helping out. Um, you know, is that something that can help bridge the gap without it being as simple as, you know, a, a phallus and an orifice getting together X times per week? How does, how, does that sound realistic though? Cause when I pitch that to people, there's always this initial, like, that's great, but that's foreplay. What do you think? I, I think you're totally right where, I mean, this idea of what sex is, is that, that glorification of penile penetration into a specific orifice, or orifice whatever that, that may be. Yeah. Um, so because that seems to, that it not seems, but that is what the glorified definition of sex is. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what a lot of people believe to be true. How can we then introduce something that is counter to what, we fundamentally believe it's true to be sex. Right. Right. So is it possible? Yeah. But I mean, it, it would totally take the willingness of individuals to open their minds and say, you know what? Yeah. Sex doesn't necessarily have to end in orgasm. Sex doesn't have to necessarily be penetration. Sex doesn't necessarily have to be insert activity here. I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole philosophical change. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not endorsed or supported in mainstream talk. Yeah. You know, I mean, people are like, oh, did you get laid? No, but at least I got a blowjob. And I'm like, well, oral sex has the word sex in it. Just right. want to point that out. Yeah. What do you think? 
Yeah, I just, oh, this, I mean, this conversation, and, and I really think, I'm trying to think more about, okay, I'm in this situation, and I'm having this conversation with a partner, and so what do I talk about? How do I broach this, whether I'm the person who wants more or less sex, and what are the 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 key pieces that I can use? Because I think that can be a really uncomfortable situation just to address that there are Oh, discrepancies. Yeah. It can be so painful just to acknowledge it to yourself, much less have a conversation, and then perhaps a fight, and then perhaps less sex. Yeah, and then what are the senses, like what emotions are you going through? You're going through embarrassment, there's guilt, there's potentially mm-hmm. anger, and shame, and all of the, these pieces. And, you know, that in and of itself, those emotions can then make that, you know, the emotional connection, or the pleasure connection, or all of those things more tenuous Mm -hmm. um, or difficult to achieve. So I don't know, I guess for me, I'm just really, it's the gravity of of this topic is really starting to sink in Mm -hmm. um, more than it was at the original part. I was like, okay, yeah, this happens now. I'm like, oh God, this happens. And then what? (laughs) Well, And for some people, this is an issue in their relationships their whole life. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. Because the goal of having a sex- successful relationship is not to have no problems or get to a place of having no problems. It's to be able to function and be okay with problems, like to get to your problems to a place where you, you can keep rolling anyway. And it's not perfect, but, you know, it's it's overall worthwhile. So it's not like we have to solve this. Mm-hmm. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I think for me, and I'm thinking of, you know, this question coming in and and to our listeners, I think it'd be great to just kind of brainstorm or think about, okay, well, how do we initiate some of those conversations Mm -hmm. for those individuals who want to, for those, you know, it's it's not something you have to do, um, but just giving some techniques or tools that maybe have worked for us in the past or people we know or uh, something just so there's a starting platform. I think that would be, I would find that useful for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking about conversations about, Maybe before, mm, so I think if you enter a conversation and you just start with, I need more sex, I need less sex, that conversation is likely to fail. Mm -hmm. And probably people know that about each other already a little bit. They have that idea. But I wonder about conversations where people think of two things. One, what is it out of the sex that they want? So maybe they want more touch. Maybe they want more sexual stimulation. Maybe they want more emotional intimacy. Maybe they want more grown-up time away from the kids. Like whatever it is, combination of those things is totally fine. Or maybe they want less um, feeling obligated or less likelihood of of pregnancy or reproduction. Like there's other things people might want less of as well. Or maybe less sex because then we can spend more time on these other things. Um, To be able to describe it that way. And then I'm wondering about the role of asking the other person to change versus saying, um, what part can I play in the two of us doing this better together? I don't know, but that sounds also like very high expectations for a very calm conversation around a difficult topic. What are your gut feelings? I'm trying to process everything and I'm got to say it's very, very difficult at the moment. So yeah, but I think a lot of people feel that way around this topic because there's Mm -hmm. so much to process and it is so difficult. And there's probably like here, we might have whatever our own emotions are that we're thinking of, but we're also people that to the best of my knowledge are not having sex with each other talking about something right. fairly calmly. Right. <laughs> and that's even still, it's difficult. Even so, still, it's difficult. Yeah. So one thing that's worked for me in the past is they have these worksheets online that you can do mm-hmm. uh, with your part. You can do with them individually and then you can have your partner do it individually, or you can do them at the same time together. And it's kind of just going through, you know, what kind of activities are you interested in? Um, what like amount of time you're interested in devoting to different types of behaviors that would be satisfying for both. So just getting that understanding for yourself of what are you looking for and what's of interest and then comparing that to see just where those discrepancies are. I'm a very analytic person when it comes to Mm -hmm. most things in my life. So something like that's really useful because it's like, all right, I can name it. I can name these areas. Yes. But I know that's not going to work for a lot of individuals because... If I, who am a person who would check off many, many things on there, um, and I tend to be interested in a higher frequency than many other people, um, were to show that to a person with lower frequency interest, I feel like it would be intimidating and upsetting, and they'd be like, yeah, I get it already. I don't know. What do you think of that? So 
and that's where I think then it's not just like here swap sheets it's about having that conversation <laughs> this is my to-do list there you go <laughs> be like okay well where are not the discrepancy but where is the matching yeah okay oh these are the things where we both have in common mm. and just let's let's focus on those at for this time because maybe those discrepancies won't exist later on maybe yeah. they will maybe they won't I mean as sexual beings we change yes. quite a bit so for me I think it's a it's more of a starting point yeah less of like a to-do list yeah. Unless you want it to be a to-do list, in which case, have fun. <laughs> That's, uh, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. What do you think? So I'm thinking that, Thomas, you make like a really good point. To that, I'd like to say that before doing or engaging in that activity with your partner, you might want to be able to establish safety and space within the relationship in order to bring in these difficult conversations. Because it is a difficult conversation, and it's not an easy one to... to uh, address because there's a lot of meaning behind the, the things that we're we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just high desire, low desire. Um, what does that fundamentally mean as as your gender, as your partner, as etc. Mm-hmm. So how can we create in this relationship this space that allows us to to talk about these difficult conversations without hurting you or, or further uh, hurting you emotionally or in any other way. Because um, ultimately, we just want to try to ameliorate something between us. Absolutely. Yeah. Really great points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have any closing thoughts that you want to contribute before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I just, I really appreciate this conversation. I, I think it's given me a lot to think about and a lot to um, reflect on. And I hope the listeners as well. Um, maybe this will spark some new questions you want to write in to Sexually Charged. Mm-hmm. What about you, Ruthie? Oh my goodness. Um, I feel like I hope that people can be affirming of the relationship before entering this conversation. Maybe it is a deal breaker topic and they have to be upfront about that, but then also with a sense of caring and lovingness that this may be a, a way that we can't match. But if, if you do feel like, you know, this relationship is worthwhile overall to like not come from a place of fear and desperation, but from a place of love and caring whether the relationship can or can't continue with it and to remember that like it's not going to be the end of the world one way or the other like if you're not getting enough yeah you you might be cranky and other issues but um and if you feel pressured same thing but to to try to come from it from a place that doesn't totalize your identities as people who are too sexual or not sexual enough Thank you for listening to Sexually Charged Radio. Thank you, Bowen and Thomas and Jason, for being here for this episode. And thank you, listeners. We hope that that you will listen to us again soon. We won't see you. 